over the past few days, I've been very, very exhausted, honestly, by reading the Conjugal Dictatorship because the last few chapters have specifically gone on about the specifics of the corruption of the administration and a lot of it is just extremely overwhelming. You know, growing up, I was aware that the Marcus administration, up to now, I'm aware that the Marcus administration was very corrupt, that there are many cronies, that they made lots of money. But when we talk about it so much, it we kind of think less about the specifics of it and it becomes more of an abstraction. And what I mean is that it just becomes this idea of corruption. And the book, what the book does is it goes into the specifics of it, where it goes from just an idea of the Marcus administration being corrupt to how each of the people involved in this whole scenario was exercising corruption and to what extent they were doing so. And it goes on for a very long time. It really singles out individual people and goes into depth of, of all just of just all of the things that they were doing. Uh, and the specific three people at the center of it all, which the book calls the Unholy Trinity, is Ferdinand Marcos, Imelda Marcos, and Cocoy Bemualdez, who was the brother of Imelda Marcos. They were the three of what uh, the author calls the unholy trinity that was at this core, at the center of all of the extreme corruption that was going on. Uh, and the, the fourth person in line, according to the author, is this guy named Roberto S. Benedicto, who, if you kind of Google and you look, go to his Wikipedia page, you know, it'll, it'll show you all the hundreds of companies he was able to amass and own as well during the administration. Uh, so it, it's honestly been overwhelming. And so I can't really, I feel like it's very difficult for me to synthesize and to put together just all of the things I've been learning or just to summarize it because it's it really defies summary because it really is goes just goes to the specifics of every single person involved in the corruption the machine and really just needs to be read. So what I'm going to do for this video is I'm just going to reflect on it, talk about my own thoughts of what I've been learning about Marcus from this book and the past few chapters. I'll go into some of the specifics of what the book brings up and I'll talk about just a general like perspective on martial law that I've been learning from other books as well. So it's kind of going to combine a lot of the things to update my own current views on martial law and Marcos and how his power was really entrenched and how he was able to exercise, exercise power. So the book, because so the author of the book, Primitivo Mijares, was very, very close to Marcos, meaning like not necessarily like close, like close friends, but maybe they were, but he was in the close circle of Marcos and he talked to him often. So he has a good sense of Marcos's inner um, perspectives and thoughts. The impression I'm getting from the book is that Marcos was someone who didn't necessarily, the, the focus doesn't seem to have been wealth or money specifically, it was more about power for Ferdinand Marcos himself. For Imelda, it seemed to be more about wealth as well as with her family because, and we'll get into it, but her family was a big part of the I guess, corruption machine. Where for Marcos, it seemed that the focus was less on money. He, he says in the book that Marcos himself lived a relatively simple life. He would eat simple food, he'd eat with his hands, he'd eat simple Ilocano cuisine. He wouldn't drink, he wouldn't smoke. Um, and so he, there's a bit of a contradiction in like, why would he be so corrupt if he doesn't even spend the money that he used? Or if he doesn't spend it necessarily, he doesn't really live, you know, a, an, a, la a lifestyle that would you, you would equate to the amount of money that he was he's kind of being corrupt with into the kind of the money that he's getting he doesn't seem to actually in his day-to-day -day life use a lot of it so wh where does it come from it seems like according to the author it, it's about exercising and increasing his own power and minimizing the power of his political opponents and i it see i guess the thing is that a lot of the political opponents that would have gone against him or that were already critical of him because of the nature of Philippine society, also happened to be some of the richest people, or the most connected people in society. So the people who, who had kind of aspirations for power in the country, were always like were all tied to these businesses, tied to these haciendas, tied to these many many industries. And Marcos wanted to minimize the ability for his political opponents to succeed him or to you know overtake him or to become leaders themselves. And so it required him to minimize the economic power of his competitors. So in a sense, you know, he would take away businesses from them, give them to, you know, either take it, take it for the government or give it to the military men or give it to his cronies. And so what happened was he had a lot of these political opponents, a lot of um, people who 
he felt were threats to his uh, power, which he really just, he, uh, it seemed like his main motivation was to maintain his power in the country. And according to the author and according to other things I've read, there sen seems to have been a kind of delusion of sorts that he was trying to recreate society in a way that would have made everything better, supposedly, and that he was kind of delusional because he wasn't aware of all the things that he was also kind of destroying with the country. But at least that's the impression I get from reading the book, where um, Marcos saw that a lot of his political opponents the thing in the Philippines is that if you're if you're a politician, in order for you to become a politician and to maintain your power in politics requires money, and so many of these people have economic interests and ties in businesses, and so by removing those businesses, they it removes their ability to mount a campaign against you or to mount a political, I guess, base against you. And so since he wanted to accumulate power, it required removing the economic power of his political enemies, and that was transferred to people within his own family or specifically Imelda's family or through specific people in government that he wanted to be on his side. So uh, a big part of that, for example, is the military. And so many military men and many of this new generation of Marcos cronies got uh, a lot of the businesses that used to be owned by the old oligarchies or the old political families that had lots of political clout and economic power. Uh, their economic power is stripped away from them and given to these new generation of people who Marcos knew he could rely on more than he could rely on the old families. And like I talked about in the past video, uh, the one of the main ones were the law business, where Coco Ibumal, the brother of Imelda, um, you know, was able to take uh, I think a lot of the Lopez businesses away from them. Um, part what some of them was like I forgot what I think it may have been Miralco, where uh, he there was like a whole thing where he he threatened uh, he he kind of the, the the son of the owner of Eugenio Lopez Senior, his son was in jail, and they, they were like saying. We will let your son out of jail if you if you let, if you sell your business to us or something. And so the guy is desperate for his son to get out of jail, and so he sells the business in this very meager, very small sum, like a thousand pesos, for something that was worth, you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions. Um, and the guy and the son never gets released from prison. So stuff like that. There's many stories like that where they are three threatening people in order for them to give up their businesses, and it goes to the government, it goes to these military officials, it goes to the new Marcos cronies. And the, again, the ones who, one of the two most powerful people at the time were Imelda Marcos and Cocoy Romualdez. The impression I get from reading other books around this period is that Marcos's power was never really strongly, I guess, in place, even when he was declaring martial law. Because as we talked about in the past few videos, Marcos was actually responsible for a lot of the a lot of the things that were going on that led up to the martial law declaration, meaning all the violence in the streets and all of the things. People were generally aware, it seems, that, that some of the things that were going on in society were because of Marcos. There was not necessarily a real threat that necessitated everyone to gather together and say, I think we all need martial law. Marcos exacerbated threats that were not there, and he used that as an excuse to have martial law. And so the foundations of martial law and its establishment were very weak. So it relied. So he, because he was in a very precarious position, he really needed to get all the people who could possibly go against him or you know threaten his hold and power. He needed to destroy them, and so he did so economically and politically as well, and putting many of them in jail. But because of the very weak foundations of Marcus's um, establishment of martial law, he required he, he required to forge bonds with people that were mostly tied by economic interest. What that means is that he needed to kind of bribe many people in order for them to maintain allegiance to him. So he would bribe them with these businesses, he'd bribe them with money, and he needed a lot of money in order to bribe the people to maintain support for him so that he can maintain his own power. And so that's what he used the money for. He was very corrupt, and a lot of the corruption was there in order to maintain his power by maintaining his allies, you know, I guess, interest in supporting him. Three of the people in the military, for example, and the police that were very powerful, that he really had to kind of make happy in order for him to feel like he was in a very secure spot was Juan Ponce Enrile, who was the head of, uh, I think, the military, head of the military, I think, and the, or he was the Secretary of Defense. There was uh, Fidel V. Ramos, who was the head of the Philippine Constabulary, which is like a, the police, I think. Or it's, it's a bit complicated. And there's uh, Fabian Nevere, who was the head of Marcos's like secret, um, secret military force or secret police force or something. 
And so these three people in the military are the same people who later on, as we know it, in the Nazi revolution, try to stage a coup against him. So, but during the time when he was trying to maintain power, he had to make all of his military in, um, friends happy, all his business friends happy, his new business friends, all his new, um, you know, it, there was just a whole structure where one of the interesting things I read from another book that I described it as was like, if in other countries, if you were powerful, if you were an economic business power, you wanted the support of the government, so you would pay the government extra taxes, extra money, so that they will support you. And in the Philippines case, the government was paying the businesses for the business to support the government. So it was a weird situation here. It was very weak, uh, Lee tied together. And so Marcus needed a lot of money. He needed to steal lots of money in order to have people continue to support him. And because for him, he had this very maniacal, delusional idea that he was going to reform Philippine society. Now, the book goes into a lot of detail about the specifics of the corruption of Imelda Marcos and just how much of a lavish a lifestyle she was living. Uh, that the book kind of goes in, you know, we know a lot about this. If you, can, you can watch The Kingmaker, it kind of goes into more detail or it kind of explains this stuff with the visuals about some of the things of how her background and how she was very poor and then she eventually got to a position of power and how she wanted to look to her people who used to overlook her and see her as someone who was important and powerful. And so she had all these things like her blue ladies who were people from these very strong political families, these women who used to look down on her and now they look up to her because they rely on her for power. She would attend all these ex very lavish um, events around the world, like different marriages to different royalties, and she would go there with expensive you know, entourages and she would build all these buildings in random parts of the world so that she would kind of have these things to really perpetuate her own uh, sense of uh, appearance and wealth and legacy so people will think of her as somewhat special because she grew up in a very poor environment that's like the story of sorts Kokai Romal is the story is that he um, they, they had this kind of mechanism within the Imelda's family of how they would threaten Marcos so they would threaten Marcos in order for Marcos to give them um, political power or money where they would uh, they have according to the book they would have spies the spy on Marcos and all his activities so that they would uncover Marcos's many mistresses and using then when they find out like that Marcos had like a secret meeting with someone and you know it, they would use that information exchange it with Imelda say like I'll tell you this thing if you help me with my business so she they'll exchange information with Imelda Imelda will get extremely pissed at, at Ferdinand and as and as contrition to Imelda Ferdinand would say okay well I'll help your sibling with a business or something because Imelda will get mad at him for, for cheating again and then she'll say also, my brother needs this thing. And then so as a way of like saying sorry to Imelda, she'll, he'll kind of help Imelda with a thing. And so there was like this whole mechanism with the families and how they would um, use Marcus's in infidelity in order to uh, get power as well. And there's just all of this stuff that goes on in the book. Kokoi Romuald is specifically as the figure who's like the mastermind behind lots of the corruption and how there was even a sense that uh, many people in the government, in the Marcos government, were already planning to succeed Marcos. Or what they were already planning. What, what, when, when Marcos gets, you know, his dictatorship ends or whatever, how can we succeed him? And according to the author, the two main figures behind a lot of the planning, apart from Enrile Ramos and Vera had their own plots, uh, there was Imelda and Kokoy, where there was a sense that they were, they were planning to have this sibling dictatorship thing, and they were planning behind the scenes of how to establish power. So Kokoy, Kokoy Romualdez became like an ambassador, for example, and he'd make all these connections around the world, and you know, Imelda herself would make connections around the world. They were like the diplomats of the Philippines of sorts. And part of this was supposedly as a way to establish their hold so that when Marcos you know, dies young because he was quite sickly as well, or something happens, they'll be able to establish power and get the support of international um, bodies and all of this stuff. So the book says a lot of stuff about how the Melda family and her, and her brother and all of their many cronies and even people in the military were all already considering what to do when Marcos ends. And so Marcos kind of ends the dictatorship or who will succeed him. And so everyone is already planning in their own minds of what to do. And Marcus himself was kind of taken over by this very delusional idea of how he wanted to reshape society. But he was turning a blind eye or allowing for the corruption of many of his family members and his cronies because he needed their support and he needed to maintain his image and power as the number one dictator in Philippine society, even though the reality is that behind the scenes, he was also beholden to many other interests that, uh, you know, shaped how he would rule the country. Now, this book, again, it's very overwhelming to read the specifics of all the corruption. If you want to know about the specifics of all the cronies, all the corruption, I'd highly recommend reading the chapters itself. Like five, six, uh, seven, eight are all about this, and it's, it's, I'm sure the more, more chapters in the future will be as well. But 
uh, that's my, I guess, reflection for today.